Good morning. My name is Corey Redderkamp. I'm the Director of Policy and Stakeholder Relations here at the Burnaby Board of Trade. And we're thrilled to have you joining us for our Sustainability 101 Getting to Net Zero session. Before I start any go any further, I want to take a moment to recognize that where I am here in our Board of Trade offices in Metrotown, we are on the traditional homeland of the Hong Kong Manum and Skohomish speaking peoples. And I want to extend appreciation for the opportunity to, to do all of our work, including today's session uh, on that territory. Um, uh, we, we, are, we are the Chamber of Commerce for the City of Burnaby and, and the Board of Trade here, and uh, we have a long history of, of being quite engaged on the sustainability topic, and I think there's, there's probably few issues that are more pressing and top of mind right now, so we're thrilled to be having today's session, having people who are, who are joining us to, to uh, have an interest in learning more about getting to net zero. Those of you who are on the line live, and I believe this session is being recorded, so you may be uh, watching us in the future, so um, uh, we'll hope glad to have you uh, joining us today. Before I get uh, started here, I did want to thank our annual partners. Uh, these are our annual board partners who are the organizations who are kind of top citizens and, and, and engaged uh, businesses in our community. And they do a lot to support the work of the Board of Trade throughout the, throughout the year in a number of different programs. So you'll see on the screen there a number of great organizations. So I want to thank each of them uh, for their work throughout the year to support the Burnaby Board of Trade. Um, setting the scene a little bit here, obviously we've had uh, uh, COP26 conference has, has wrapped up, and I know that focus on the urgency of the climate crisis and the need to collaborate, learn, understand how uh, Canada and the world can meet its, tar its target of net zero um, in, in the coming years. I think we've, we've seen underpin quite dramatically uh, some of the impacts this week of, of climate change and, and both, both the impacts of what's coming and the impacts of, how, of, uh, of not having uh, our, our surroundings hardened for, for the mitigation, for the impacts that are, are going to be coming. Um, and uh, so we've seen that kind of displayed on our TV screens and, and for some of us in our backyards uh, quite dramatically over the last few days. And while government has a definite role in playing to play in leading uh, us in this challenge, I think the business community has a pivotal role in helping to reach our net zero targets as well. Um, but for business, what does that mean? And, 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 and what net zero means is, is different for different types of sectors and businesses. So we wanted to have today's session uh, to dive into that a little bit. And, and we have today's pre present presentation uh, with representatives here from Van City and from Stantec, uh, two great members of the Burnaby Order Trade. And they're going to be looking at how these two organizations are planning to meet their own net zero goals and, and move forward in, in this uh, in this space. So um, I'm pleased to introduce our panel for today. We've got uh, uh, four great uh, speakers who will be joining us and sharing their, their thoughts. Uh, first, I have Alison Coates as Van City's Director of Climate Strategy and Performance, uh, who, who leads the collaboration with people and teams across the credit union to shape and oversee Van City's response to the climate crisis. Allison is, is a social and environmental sustainability professional who has held senior leadership positions in Canada and internationally and has led on the development of global sustainability strategies in the financial sector. Allison, thanks so much for joining us. I also have uh, Brad Moore from Stantec, uh, is a civil engineer uh, specializing in the fields of project coordination and sustainable infrastructure design. Brad's diverse experience includes preliminary and detailed designs, tendering, contract administration, and construction inspection on a variety of roadway and municipal projects. I'm sure you have some thoughts on what's going on right now in the province. Uh, his emphasis on sustainability through design and construction has been recognized by the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure with the first Envision Award for sustainable infrastructure given to a project that was done over in Alberta. Uh, so Brad, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Samantha Lane. Uh, Samantha is a building performance engineer uh, with Stantec. Her job is to help clients optimize their projects to realize energy efficiency and sustainability goals without compromising on inspiring design elements or breaking the bank. Uh, in her position, Sam is responsible for mentoring Stantec's growing team of sustainability and building performance specialists throughout Western Canada and driving innovative analysis to inform project work. Uh, Samantha, thanks so much for joining us this morning. And, and, and lastly, I want to introduce uh, Tanya Doran, uh, also with Stantec. Uh, Tanya spent uh, her career championing sustainable building design from her first role at an electric utility provider to her recent senior roles consulting for large national organizations and the Electric Transmission Council in Edmonton. Tanya has seen the evolution of sustainable design practice across Western Canada. Um, Tanya has been the executive director of the Alberta chapter of the Canada Green Building Council and has spent 17 years engaged with them and, and, and their annual sustainable building symposium. So Tanya, Samantha, Brad, Allison, thanks so much uh, for joining us for today's session. Uh, we're th thrilled to have your, your, your insights and thoughts and share those with our members. So uh, I believe, Allison, I'm going to be passing it over to you to carry us off from here. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Corey. Um, and I'll just wait for the slides to come up and then I'll get started. 
Fantastic. Thanks very much. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm joining you from the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations here in Vancouver. I'm going to talk to you today about Grand City's approach to climate action, including net zero. Um, and then I'm going to do a deep dive specifically into net zero. So why do it, what it is, the science behind it, and how to get started. We've all probably heard the term net zero bouncing around a lot, usually attached to a year like 2050. But I think sometimes we've forgotten to explain exactly what it is, why we're doing it, and why there's actually a timeline attached to it. Um, if you could move to the next slide, it's a little bit about Van City and our journey um, towards our um, action on climate. So you might be wondering why you've got a credit union here talking to you about climate action when actually we have relatively small operational emissions. Um, but climate and social action uh, has been a space that Van City has operated for a long time. We offered the first low interest loan for low emission vehicles. Our fossil, our investment funds are fossil fuel free. We don't lend to fossil fuel projects. We've had a number of other milestones along the way. And next slide. But despite this, um, it was becoming clear uh, over the last few years that we needed to be doing more. Uh, we'd been accounting for our own operational emissions and driving them down for a long time. But one of the things we weren't doing is we weren't accounting for the emissions of the things that we finance. And that's really important. There's a saying in the, in the financial sector that what gets financed gets done. Um, so after a significant amount of work, in early 2021, we came out with a set of climate commitments that are going to chart our pathway on climate action for the next 20 years. And these commitments came from the belief that we really need a new economy. We need a resilient economy that works for everyone and that aligns people, planet, and prosperity. So we made a set of uh, five climate commitments um, over the, the near term. So if you move to the next slide, I'll talk about sort of the headline commitment that we came out with. Um, so our signature commitment, so to speak, is to make density net zero by 2040 across all of our mortgages and loans. So what that means is the carbon um, and greenhouse gases emitted from anything that we finance will be eliminated or significantly reduced, and any remaining emissions will be brought to zero. Uh, our next commitment was around financing an equitable climate transition, if you move to the next slide. So here, we're really going to focus our work on financial and social inclusion and provide banking and other solutions to help people who are affected by the climate emergency. <laughs> if you're on our Instagram over the past few days, we're definitely reaching out to help people who've been, been impacted um, by the floods and by the storm. But we're also working to provide financing solutions uh, to those who are seeking support and transitioning to cleaner and more sustainable living. Next slide. Um, and another thing we're doing um, is switching all of our investing. So we're switching to only responsible investment options um, that can demonstrate the integrity of their environmental, social, and corporate governments, governance, uh, so their ESG um, credentials. Um, and we do uh, screening and stewardship associated with that. And I know Stantec is going to talk a little bit about ESG and what that means. In terms of how we're going to go about delivering on those commitments, uh, moving to the next slide, um, we have a, a commitment to be really open and transparent throughout this process. So we want to encourage change within the financial services sector by accurately measuring and reporting on how our own actions are improving the well-being of people and communities and the environment. And we'll talk about what's working for us and what's also not working because this progress towards net zero and towards climate action um, is challenging. And there's a lot of uh, working through new space um, where nobody's gone before. And then lastly, on the next slide, we have a commitment around walking the talk and all we do. So we'll continue to do that work in our own operations, so driving down our, our own emissions um, or our direct operational emissions. And we also will work to serve as a living lab to test new solutions to the climate crisis. So let's dive into a little bit of why we are going um, to be doing this. If you move forward, um, let's talk about why we're doing this and why we're specifically pursuing a net zero goal and why your business should consider doing the same. Moving to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about the situation that we are in right now. We'll start in a space that hopefully we all <laughs> probably know pretty well and what 
hopefully became, uh, well, that's, I think, definitely become apparent in British Columbia over the past six months or so. And that is that global warming is happening now already. It's not a problem for the future. And it's a problem specifically for us as humans. We have already warmed the planet by just over a degree in terms of average temperature. That warming has been caused by humans and it's primarily from burning fossil fuels. So how it works is fuels are burnt, they release greenhouse gases, that warms um, the atmosphere trapping uh, sunlight inside. How much um, are we releasing? If you look at the black line on the, on the graph on the slide, that's carbon dioxide parts per million in the atmosphere. And you can pretty clearly see um, that as parts per million increase, the average temperature for that year increases significantly. Moving on to the next slide. So I mentioned that this warming is not, not good for us, as you can see over the past week. Um, it's not good for us. It's not good for the resources that we rely on, our infrastructure. It's not good for the species that we share the planet with. Um, and it can be quite dangerous and it will continue to become more dangerous. So here on the slide, you can see some of the impacts of an average increase of one and a half degrees um, versus an increase of two degrees. Um, so just that little bit extra of warming um, is a pretty serious challenge for us. And when you're looking at this, keep in mind, we've already warmed the planet by just over a degree. So we're talking about small, small increases here that we need to stay within. And to be clear, this doesn't mean that it's just always going to be one or two degrees warmer. We've really noticed that. Um, it's just the average. What it actually means is more significant heat overall, but, but very significant heat at certain times. So it means things like more heat waves like we experienced this summer, but even for longer than we experienced. Um, and it also means things like winters with oats. Uh, moving to the next slide. So now, now that I've maybe depressed all of us um, significantly this early in the morning, let's talk about how, how we deal with it um, and what kind of pathway we need to take to keep this warming to one and a half degrees, which is essentially the sort of still fairly safe space um, for humans and for the species we share the planet with. So uh, there's a lot of modeling that's gone into this. I'm not gonna go into the background behind that, but in climate model pathways that keep warming at or very close to one and a half degrees, human caused CO2 emissions need to reach net zero around 2050. So that means emissions need to drop year over year, and then any remaining emissions by 2050 are brought to zero by carbon removal. So that's why you often hear net zero with that date attached to it. And some organizations will go a little bit sooner. You see some countries who are a little bit later. There's some nuance around the different greenhouse gases. But if you just remember one thing, it's net zero by 2050 equals one and a half degrees. So on the left side, um, you can see an illustration of what, oh, just going back one. Um, on the left side you, of the slide, oh, there you go. <laughs> you can see an illustration of what net zero looks like. So the gray is emissions reductions, the blue is emissions, and the green is carbon removal. And you can see here the focus is really on emissions reductions. And how much the world warms is really dependent on how much we reduce and how much we remove emissions from the atmosphere. And so on the right, you can see um, different levels of warming that will happen based on different climate policies that are delivered. Um, and that's why that net zero by 2050 is so important. Reaching that and delivering policies aligned with that, that should keep warming to one and a half degrees. All right, now we'll move on to the next slide, talk a little bit about net zero versus carbon neutral. So you might be wondering, is net zero different from achieving carbon neutrality? The answer is that from a scientific perspective, no, there's not a difference. But carbon neutrality um, in the past has often been used to describe the practice of balancing emissions with an equivalent amount of carbon offsets. What that meant is that a company or a country could be carbon neutral, but not reduce emissions at all and just purchase carbon offsets. Now, a lot of companies, and this fancy included, have approached carbon neutrality for their own operations with a focus on driving down emissions and then offsetting, but that's not always been 
what has happened. The norm for credible net zero commitments, so those norms are that they focus on the largest source of emissions. Often scope three, a lot of carbon neutrality commitments didn't include um, some of the more significant uh, um, scope three emissions. Um, they maximize emissions reductions and they target reaching zero um, by 2050 or, or sooner. Um, move to the next slide. So we've talked a lot about the physical risk um, to humans and species, but I want to just add one more um, piece to the equation on, on and why we should be acting on, on climate risk. The changes that we are going to see um, and that we are going to go through over the next century are going to be very significant. And the people and communities who are likely to be most negatively impacted by these are disproportionately Black, Indigenous, people of color, and low income. And it's often the groups who've had um, the, least, the smallest role in actually creating the, the problem that we're in. And so if we don't act in a manner that protects people and the planet and where we move towards net zero, we are going to see increasing inequity. And that's not good for society and it's certainly not good for business. So how do you get started? <laughs> Let's move uh, to the next slide and then we can move quickly to the following one. Um, perfect, thank you. So moving towards a clean and fair world. Um, there's a lot of detail that goes into it, but I think fundamentally the first piece is about understanding as a business your impact. So the good and the bad. Um, and, and the key part of that is actually understanding the emissions of your business, along with the other positive and negative social and environmental impacts you're having. Once you understand those, make a plan. Make a plan to increase positive impacts and reduce negative impacts, including emissions. And then you can move on to the next stage, and that's really sharing your story, supporting others to do the same, and advocating for policies that are going to support these efforts. Let me move to the next slide. Sometimes it's a little hard to know where to start with that, um, and so I want to point this group to a couple of resources that are out there. So at Man City, we've actually just produced a brand new guide to help businesses take climate action, and it talks about the case for climate action, how it can help your business. Um, and actually be a positive for, for the bottom line, um, and then where to start. Um, and then there's also a, a, a global resource called the SME Climate Hub, where businesses can go on, access resources, and actually sign a net zero pledge. So I will put those links to the guide um, and the um, SME Climate Hub in the chat in a second. Um, and feel free to use those. The guide is publicly available. It's not just for Van City members. Uh, anyone can use it. And then I'll also post a link to um, our work around uh, net zero and our climate commitments more broadly. Thanks very much. And I will pass it over to our next speaker. Excellent. Thanks, Allison. I'm just going to share my screen here, everyone. I'll just give you one second. Perfect. Let me know when you can see that screen. We can see that, Tanya. Perfect. Thanks so much. So a, a little bit about us, so a little sustainability 101 here as it relates to uh, Net Zero, Allison has set us up with uh, all of the challenges that certainly we're expecting. Three of us today. So my name is Tanya Doran. I am the Western Canada Carbon Lead here at Stantec, as introduced sooner. And I get the privilege of working with both Sam and Brad. Hello, I'm Sam Lane. I'm a building performance engineer at Stantec. And I, I get the privilege of working with Tanya and Brad and a whole bunch of other people who are really smart and think about this all the time. I'm also uh, at Stantec, Brad Morris, Sustainable Infrastructure Team Leader. So. Perfect. So w why is this really important to us? Well, I'm going to go back to some basics here. This is my, my favorite definition of sustainability. Uh, you know, I go back often to the original Brettland uh, definition of sustainability that was defined in the World Commission on Environmental and Development in 1987. So really talking about meeting the needs of the future generation without um, 
inhibiting the needs of future generations to meet their own needs and really balancing that economic development opportunities that we're always looking for with the protection of social and environmental balance. So here at Stantex, I think it's, it's obvious, uh, I hope it's obvious why we're engaged in sustainability and why it's such a key to us is that every sector we touch as an organization really includes sustainability as a driving metric. So our infrastructure services, which Brad will talk about a little later, right through our buildings, which Sam and I are heartily engaged in on a regular basis, right through to our uh, key services, our water environmental services, and then even in our energy and resources department, looking at more renewable resources and how we continue to keep that climate mitigation at, at, uh, at bay. Typical sustainable or pillars of sustainability that Allison talked about a little bit as well, that environmental, social, and economic piece that is so important. And, you know, we have a number of questions that we ask as we're talking about these pillars as well, making sure that we're considering the materials that we're specifying, not only for sustainability outcomes, but also how we engage with each project and how those materials are good for both humans and the ecosystem. You know, where do we have nature-based solutions? How can we provide those most efficient designs and where we can promote some of those diversity pieces as well? So that sustainability definition for us here internally is really broad and it goes beyond net zero and energy. Uh, we're really proud of that because we've won some really fantastic awards here in the last year being named the fifth most sustainable corporation in the world and the first most sustainable corporation in North America by uh, Corporate Knights. And then just most recently, last week, Brad has made the top 30 under 30 uh, in the same realm from Corporate Knights. So uh, quick, quick shout out to Brad and his great work in this area. So our own commitments are pretty strong. So we like to walk that talk as well and not just tell our clients and work with our clients to deliver on these solutions but to really get there ourselves. So we've made a commitment to carbon neutrality by 2020 and net zero for our own operations by 2030. So how we're gonna do that is really in three distinct phases. So that first one, and Allison has already mentioned some of those science-based targets that we're looking for. Then we're looking towards that carbon neutrality in the next year and then further on to net zero. So we've really outlined those phases within our own corporate goals. Those phases on number one is to reduce and eliminate our carbon use through our reduction efforts. So ensuring that we have reduction strategies within all of our own spaces and all of our own operations. Two is to balance those through investing in renewable credits, uh, like Allison mentioned, and through that carbon offsetting. So we started that early this year and it'll continue on through next year and the year after. And finally, to balance any residual energy use and emissions with our actions, adding renewable energy and grid and, and uh, carbon capture as well all the way through 2030. So it really starts to outline here at Stantec our own commitment to sustainability and that roadmap that we have all the way through to 2030 to meet our full net zero uh, company as an organization and how we're going to continue to do that. And in our own design philosophy here at Stantec, we've committed to the architecture 2030 uh, challenge as well. So all of our projects are intended to be net zero by 2030 on that front. And we've made a commitment to model uh, in the coming years, 50% of all of our projects on the energy front as well across our practice. And so our practice is a global practice with just over 400 offices. So with that, we're going to talk a little bit about how we provide some of these characters, some of these criteria in terms of our clients on the building side. And so over to Sam. Hi, everybody. Uh, all right. So like I said, I'm a building performance engineer at Stantec. So I uh, talk about net zero buildings quite a bit. So let's get started. Uh, net zero is the sort of buzzword or the, the popular topic of the day, especially with COP26 coming to an end. Um, you know, we all saw these headlines in the last few weeks. Um, and I expect that we will see them more and more. So really, we want to give give more of a fundamental understanding of what that means um, in our buildings and in general. So uh, so first, like Tanya did with sustainability, I like to start with a definition of what net zero actually is. So when we're talking about a building, a net zero energy building generates as much energy as it uses in a year. So a building that can generate enough energy to offset its energy use on an annual basis. And if you are a picture person, um, Next slide. 
Yeah, if you're, there you go. So you can see uh, here's our building. It's super energy efficient. Uh, it is tied to the grid. So that's a common misconception is that a net zero energy building has to be a standalone uh, disconnected from the electricity grid. That's not true. So uh, in this case, it's tied to the grid. And when the sun's not shining and the solar panels aren't generating enough, it's pulling from the grid. But when the sun is shining, it's generating enough that it's actually exporting back to the grid after it satisfies what it needs in the building. So if we hit net zero energy, that means that over an annual basis, that the amount purchased from the grid um, equals the amount sold back to the grid. Next slide. Right. Um, so if you hear net zero energy ready, um, this is the same same design philosophy as net zero energy, except they just haven't purchased the solar panels yet. So they've done all the calculations to know um, that it will work out, that we have enough generation potential with the roof area and the site area. But uh, the plan is to purchase those renewable energy systems at a later date. And we often see this um, when budgets are constrained, but projects want to do the right thing and make sure that their building is set up for success in the long term. Next slide, yeah. So there you can see those solar panels in a net zero energy ready building just wouldn't be purchased and installed on day one. And last but not least, our definition of a net zero carbon building. So this is a building that produces on site or procures enough carbon free renewable energy or offsets to counterbalance the annual carbon emissions from building operations. So really, instead of energy, we're talking about carbon now. Um, and lots of people say this is where we should should be focusing um, because our issue is greenhouse gas emissions, not energy consumption. So next slide. When we talk about net zero carbon, there's lots of things that we can talk about. Um, at a minimum, we have to talk about our operational carbon. So this is the carbon that's emitted in the building itself. This could be, you know, maybe we have a natural gas boiler and there's a flu stack there, or maybe we have a natural gas furnace, something like that. And that's emitting greenhouse gas emissions. Or we have an op the operational carbon associated with energy generation. So just because electricity, um, you know, we often see electricity as a form of energy and we talk about electrifying our buildings and that makes them green. But that's only true if our electricity comes from a green source. So in British Columbia, we're really lucky. We have very green electricity supply. Um, but the same building in Alberta, because they don't have a green electricity supply, would not be a green building, would not be pulling green supply. And even in British Columbia, we don't have a perfectly green grid. Um, we do have some emissions associated with it. And we also want to talk about embodied carbon. So this is sort of a new, um, a new direction for the buildings industry. It's still in its fledgling state. And Brad's going to talk a little bit more about it later too. But this is also accounting for all the carbon that's invested into the building through the materials and construction that goes into it. So you can think about that as if our choice is to tear down an existing building and build a new one or to retrofit that existing building, um, perhaps we should retrofit that existing building because a lot of carbon was invested in the materials that are already there. Or if we're building a new building, um, what material selections can we make that are the most responsible when it comes to carbon? So things like using wood instead of using steel or concrete. And advancing to net zero. So this uh, sort of roadway ideology is, is really popular. Um, and I just want to point out two things on this graphic. So this is from the World Green Building Council. There's lots to unpack here. But it, this really sets the timeline that the world seems to be um, conforming to, or at least targeting. So uh, in 2050, you can see there, they're saying that 100% of buildings need to be net zero carbon. So by 2050. And by 2030, all new buildings must operate at net zero carbon. So the difference between those two targets is 2030 is anything that's constructed in 2030 and beyond. And by 2050, all of our existing buildings also have to reach that net zero carbon um, milestone. So 2050 is not, uh, not that far away. What are we? Um, it's 2021 now. So all the buildings that we're in right now are likely to be around in 2050. So the amount of retrofitting that we have to do um, is significant in the next 29 years. So uh, that's, that's a huge challenge for the buildings industry. And if we go next slide. 
There we go. So why, why are we focusing on 2050 um, and why is this a focus in Canada? So probably seeing things like this, Trudeau unveils Canada's net zero by 2050 plan. So we really have downloaded that global 2050 target. And next slide. And in here, so this is Canada's pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change, or Canada's plan to address climate change and grow the economy. So how do we tackle this challenge? How do we get there by 2050? And how do we do it in a way that is um, sort of sustainable, both economically and, and sustainably from a carbon perspective? So in this document, it's actually, it's an interesting read. Um, you Maybe not everyone would find it as interesting as I do, but I certainly liked it. So... Uh, in there, it says increasingly stringent model building codes starting in 2020 that will get us to net zero energy ready by 2030. So again, um, sort of looking at that, that 2030 target. And next, another really important part here is that the federal government has said, if we look in a timeline of sort of where our building codes are going, um, the federal government has said that in 2022, we're expecting them to release an existing building energy code. So this is sort of um, ground shaking almost in the buildings industry. But uh, this means this is how we're going to get all those buildings to net zero carbon by 2050 is we have to start with an existing building energy code. So even the buildings that are brand new today, um, they will be judged pretty soon on their actual energy or carbon um, efficiency. So what tools do we have to reduce energy consumption in buildings? Well, I have four of sort of the biggest ones here um, that I'd like to like to sort of bring up. You might hear about them, so we won't get too in detail. Uh, I don't expect you to all be mechanical engineers or anything, but um, the first one on the top left is a heat pump system. So a heat pump almost seems magical. If we have an electric boiler in a building, um, electric boilers are known as 100% efficient. So, you know, if you put one unit of electricity into it, you get one unit of heat out of it. So that's great. Um, a gas boiler would be something like 80% efficient. So you put one unit of, of energy in the form of gas into it and you have some losses through the flu. Um, so you only get 0.8 of a unit of heat out of it. So, but with a heat pump, you're not creating heat. Um, you're not combusting anything to get heat. You're just moving heat. So you pay an electric heat pump, one unit of electricity, and it can move multiple units of heat. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't break the laws of thermodynamics or anything. We're not creating energy, but we're moving it. Um, and heat pumps are really good at moving heat around. So you can use heat pumps in the summer to cool your building and pump the heat out, or you can use them in the winter to pump the heat in. Um, and in most of BC's climate, heat pumps are actually a really great, uh, great choice. In the center here, um, I have a picture of a ground source system. So you might hear this as geothermal. I don't like to use the word geothermal because that gets confusing with, you know, deep geothermal into the magma deposits of Iceland sort of thing. That's a different technology. Um, but this is a, a heat pump that's connected to the ground. So it's not a form of renewable energy, but it is a really efficient HVAC system where again, we're paying, paying the ground source heat pump one unit of electricity, and it's going to move a bunch of units of heat. So in the wintertime, we can take heat out of the ground and in the summertime, we can put it back into cool our building. So those are two sort of swanky technologies that we expect to see a lot more, both in new construction buildings and existing buildings. And then on the right here, you can see, um, we call this the building envelope. So the building envelope is the skin of a building. And traditionally we've had pretty terrible building envelopes in Canada. Um, they've been quite uninsulated. They've had a lot of what we call thermal bridges, which let heat out of the building. So this is an example of a really well insulated wall system. So you can see that it's first of all, quite thick. Um, if you look at those window sort of ledges on both the inside and the outside, you can see that they're, they're quite quite deep. Um, you can see that the window is a triple pane window and there's like a wood frame there and it's all thermally broken. You don't see a lot of metal. Um, and you see that it's a, it's a wood structure. It's not, not a steel stud structure. So lots of things going on there to make it a really well insulating building envelope. And then bottom left, I have another tool here. So this is a image from an energy modeling software. So this is a software where we can model the performance of a building before it's even constructed. Um, so while we're working on the design, we can tweak different design elements 
to see what the repercussions are from an energy or carbon perspective. And we do this um, on buildings across Canada almost completely now um, when we're in the design stage to prove that they are efficient enough to meet our building codes. And next slide, yeah. So we also have the tools of on-site generation. So usually when we're talking about building on-site generation, um, we're talking about solar panels. There are some other options like solar thermal or um, wind power, but predominantly just based on pure economics um, and what we can generate. These days we're talking about solar. So lots of people think of solar and they think of solar panels on the roof, like the bottom left there. But we also have carport shading, which has some additional benefits. Um, number one, it can take your parking lot, which is not exactly a beacon of sustainability on most projects, and turn it into something that really is truly an impressive generation resource. Um, also protects your car from sun or from hail damage, uh, which I'm located in Calgary, and that's a big concern here. And uh, bottom right, have an example of some solar shading. So these panels serve two focus, two purposes. Um, they're generating electricity using the sun, but they're also blocking the summer sun from entering the building. So and giving us heat that we don't want while allowing the low winter sun um, to bring that heat into the building when we do want it in the winter. So lots of options we have with solar panels. And we also have some tools for purchasing renewable energy certificates or offsets. So I uh, very recently this weekend switched my electricity plan to a new provider with a fixed rate plan because my variable rate bill was shocking uh, in October. And I had this option at the end to purchase green energy and add green energy to my plan. And you can see there that it's called a renewable energy certificate. Um, you can contribute to the purchase of renewable energy certificates. So when you purchase a renewable energy certificate, Nothing about the power delivered to your home changes. However, you're paying the price differential for someone else to generate renewables and put them onto your grid. So um, in my case, you know, if I buy a renewable energy certificate, someone somewhere in Alberta is going to put renewable energy onto the Alberta grid to offset my use. So it's a way of voting with your dollar um, when you don't necessarily have space on site to install solar panels um, and really off, or maybe you do, but you don't have enough space to offset your total use, then you can look at renewable energy certificates. In addition to renewable energy certificates, we also have carbon offsets. So I uh, put in into the WestJet flight calculator. We've all probably seen this. You book a, book a flight and there's an option to offset. So if you open WestJet's flight calculator and you put in a round trip from Calgary to Vancouver, um, that's 0.1 tons of carbon that you need to offset. And I had two options here to offset that. Uh, one was in Newfoundland, it was a climate and ecosystems conservancy project. And another was in the Niagara Escarpment, sort of a forest reclamation carbon project. Both were pretty cool. And so for only $3, I could offset the carbon associated with my flight. So um, carbon offsets are, they can be a little bit controversial. So can renewable energy certificates. Sometimes people see it as sort of a way out, like a cop out where you're not doing fully the right thing. You're just paying your way out of this situation. Um, but for things like flights, like th there isn't really an alternative option as a consumer. So offsetting, um, offsetting is a good, good first step at least. And so net zero isn't just for buildings. Um, Brad's going to talk about it a little bit on the infrastructure side, but we buildings make up like 30 to 40% of our emissions, but there's lots of other industries um, that will also need to tackle similar challenges and they'll have totally different tools in order to do so. So transportation is a huge one, both municipal transit, getting people around, but also um, shipping of goods around the world. So, and we've seen how, how intense dis disruptions to that supply chain can be for our world. So this is a huge challenge that we have. Agriculture is another really big one. How we produce our food is very carbon intensive right now. So that industry getting to net zero will be very challenging. And energy generation is one that I don't have here, but how we generate our electricity um, will be a huge topic in the coming years. And so my last slide, what we know to be true. So the business case for net zero energy and carbon exists today, especially when we factor in the consequences of climate change, like we're seeing in BC right now, um, when we factor in the carbon levy or the carbon tax. Uh, codes are for laggards and not leaders. So our codes are trying to get us there at the sort of the 
least possible aggressive way. Um, they are for laggards. They're not for people who are leaving the pack. And so if you wait until the code changes, um, you're going to find that your building is behind the times and playing catch up. So we're encouraging our clients to at least look at some aspects of how they can be leaders and demonstrate leadership in the area of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, occupant health and well-being matters. So, you know, with the global pandemic, we've all seen that things like ventilation really matter and filtration really matters. And we can't forget, especially when we're talking about buildings where people spend 90% of their time, we can't forget about the impact that some of these decisions will have on the occupants of these buildings and the users. So we always have to do the right thing. Um, and a strong integrated team can achieve impressive results. So none of these problems can be solved by one person or one discipline on a project. It's always gonna be an integrated approach. All right, off to you, Brad. So um, now let's take a look at how we can integrate some of these sustainability principles into our infrastructure projects. And there has been a lot of discussion, most notably in the US on what is infrastructure. Um, so I thought we could start there. Um, now for our discussion today, we will be considering the roads, bridges, water lines, wastewater systems, drainage networks, energy grids, telecom lines, and parks that connect people to their community, institutions, and local business. Well, what does sustainable infrastructure mean? Um, that is designing and building our infrastructure with a new approach that is considerate of environmental, social, and economic factors. And similar to Sam, why is this important? Um, well, just this Monday, Metro van was cut off from the interior by a massive rainfall that caused significant damage to our transportation system. It stopped the flow of goods from our busy West Coast ports to the rest of Canada. It cut off parts of the province to critical services. And unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident. Um, Abbotsford has experienced, experienced the hottest day and the wettest day in history, only 140 days apart. A bomb cyclone brought sustained winds of 100 kilometers an hour. Vancouver experienced their first tornado in over 50 years. And the community of Lytton set the national all-time heat record three times in 48 hours, followed by devastating wildfires. And all of this is happening locally within the past 150 days. Now our infrastructure system is under an immense pressure from a growing economy, a changing climate, and a focus on ensuring social concerns be appropriately addressed. This infrastructure stress causes localized flooding, power outages, traffic congestion, and many more issues impacting all types of communities and businesses. Each year, it is estimated that over 1.2 billion is lost in productivity in Metro Vancouver due to delays caused by our decaying transportation infrastructure. That is costing citizens and businesses across Canada almost $3 billion annually to repair vehicles due to poor road conditions. This stress on our infrastructure is also resulting in $12 billion in losses due to power outages across Canada. And this shows some of the links between the condition of our infrastructure and our potential economic growth. It is estimated that up to half of Canada's productivity growth in the last 45 years can be attributed to investment in public infrastructure. Now, the concept of net zero in infrastructure is not as well developed as it is in the building sector. However, it remains a critical long-term goal that will require engagement from stakeholders, designers, contractors, government officials, businesses, suppliers, and others to implement. The government of Canada is concerned currently considering proposals to pursue net zero emissions by 2050. But infrastructure is a massive, slow moving glacier that struggles to adapt to a rapidly evolving climate, promote economic growth and address social concerns. And that's because infrastructure projects can take years and even decades to design and build. And the benefit is that a new bridge might be in service for 50 to 100 years. But when we look at being net zero by 2050, the projects we build today will likely still be in service in 2050. From the list of major infrastructure assets, only the roadways might be replaced once by 2050. We are very likely to have the same railways and bridges and water treatment systems, uh, power facilities that are being built today. And so how do we improve that infrastructure that will be in place for 2050? Uh, we integrate those sustainability considerations throughout all phases of our infrastructure, the planning, design, construction, and operation. But these are large, complex projects. 
we need guidance on what opportunities we, we can pursue to improve those environmental, social, and economic components of our projects. And for that guidance, the industry has set up a number of frameworks that include anywhere from 14 to 64 factors that projects could consider to improve their sustainability. The most established frameworks are Envision, Green Roads, and Invest. And each of these frameworks is roughly 10 years old um, and they help provide guidance to teams on more sustainable infrastructure. But at their core, what are they? Um, they're basically a scorecard for an infrastructure project. If a, if a team addresses a specific environmental, social, or economic factor, the project would receive points. Sustainable infrastructure frameworks also provide guidance to project teams on how they can make incremental steps to improve the project's sustainability and earn even more points. Um, as mentioned, they, can, they consider between 14 and 64 metrics that are referred to as credits. If a project addresses enough credits, it can receive an award for demonstrating improvement towards more sustainable infrastructure. But what are examples of some of those credits? So now let's consider a project here in Metro Van. Um, let's say this road has been in place for 30 years and needs to be replaced. Um, what kind of guidance can we get from a sustainable infrastructure framework to help inform our design? Um, well, this major street reconstruction would need to mitigate all the noise and vibrations, mobility concerns during construction um, that we would want to reduce for the residents who live next to the project. We're going to want to preserve the views of the mountains. Um, we want to consider how we can enhance some of the existing green space. But not only that, what if we could also reduce some of the light pollution? Um, and down on the lower left, we see a drainage grate. Like we saw earlier this week, it might be key to manage the stormwater for a shifting climate. But maybe at the same time, we can improve pedestrian and cyclist facilities by dedicating space for that active transportation. Another consideration could be improving signage and wayfinding. Obviously, we see the street name sign, but how do we get to the hospital that's only one minute from this intersection? Thinking a little more long term, is there an opportunity to reduce our energy needs for traffic lights or street lights? Uh, also talking about monitoring those utility systems that are there, and we know that all of that utility infrastructure is currently under that roadway. So how we engage that utility infrastructure for ongoing monitoring and ensure that we have an appropriate sustainable and resilience policy in terms of those utility systems and climate change adaptation. Uh, the, the next one that we have there, let me just see if one popped up. There we go, is to use recycled materials, being cognizant of the materials that we are also using on those projects and how we're not only using the materials that are recycled, but are recycling the materials that do come off of this project. So who's using some of these systems that we have and the ones that Brad is currently working on now? So of course, we have a number of municipalities using the systems as well as the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority and the BC Ministry itself of Transportation and Infrastructure. There's a number of large infrastructure projects that are being used and using these verifications and these frameworks that are available to us in terms of, you know, mandating these requirements, but also proving the requirements uh, that they're looking to achieve in terms of their own goals. So just to go, go back again in terms of this, so let's go back to that slide that Sam had regarding what we know to be true. So in terms of infrastructure, we see a lot of those same themes. So the infrastructure for net zero 2050 is being built today. And Brad went over that that life cycle. Again, codes are for laggards, not leaders. So doing that minimum is just that. It is the minimum. It's not a leadership opportunity in terms of those climate impacts that certainly we see and the goals that we've set out for ourselves. Again, health and well-being matters. So incorporating the, uh, the responses to uh, projects and to infrastructure projects like ensuring we continue views, we provide for active transportation, et cetera, throughout those infrastructure projects. And finally, same thing is true, a strong integrated team can achieve impressive results. So coming on board really early on with that strong integrative team and setting these goals as early on as possible in terms of a project's life uh, really helps achieve them and helps us uh, all see the results that we're trying to achieve. So with that, uh, we are ready to move on to some questions. So I am going to stop sharing and uh, we'll move from there. 
Correct. Thanks. Thanks, Tanya. And, and thanks for, for jumping in there. We've had a bit of that in the last couple of weeks with uh, power outages. I guess that's the, the nature of the, of the beast right now. But uh, so hopefully uh, uh, we doing OK there. But thanks for, for jumping in and finishing off that, that portion there. Um, so anyone watching, if you had a question or a comment, feel free to put it into the chat box or the q and I've got a couple that have, that have come in um, on, on this. But one of the things I wanted to, to touch base, one of the questions was just around the, the process internally. So either you've both spoken about or all of you have spoken about stuff that you're, you're doing kind of externally with your stamp of obviously with the, your, your clients density with your things you're financing but also kind of what you've done internally as an organization and, and Tanya I noticed um I, I think it might have been on your slides and then forgive me I'm mixing up the slides now but I think you had that that route to net zero where you had the different from 2020 all the way through to to um your your goals there that was quite detailed and and, and developed we've had a couple of questions just around the what what kind of like what kind of lead time was that? How 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 long did that take you guys to do? If people are because some of our people on the call might be in varying stages of that, some people might be looking to start that. Um, so uh, and that might be kind of a, a, a daunting a daunting uh, screenshot that you put up there. So what can you can you comment on to kind of how that development was and, and how long Stantec was working on putting together such a clear roadmap? Absolutely. And and before I, I just lean into that, I want to let you know that we are we're a global organization. So we have just under nineteen thousand employees in four hundred offices. <laughs> in I've, I've lost count 22 different countries so you know it it was not a small period of time in terms of us putting together our roadmap as well so that is that is the first thing i just want to set out so in terms of how we do it uh you know it was a multiple year process in terms of making those commitments and and putting the goals and the targets in place and that is wholly responsible to an internal group that we have here in stantec that is focused on that with my colleague, Carrie Sabin, who works out of our Denver office. She's our VP of sustainability and looks after all of our internal metrics and goals. And she works with a committee of individuals on those goals and then is part of a larger committee that reports actually directly to our board of directors in terms of our corporate governance. So when we start to think about the fact that we are a publicly traded organization and what those corporate commitments make, and also that we are part of the New York Stock Exchange Sustainability Index, uh, it was an multi-year commitment to come up with that framework. And, you know, in my experience, and when I started working with Carrie on some of those metrics, it's been approximately three years from the start and collecting data and all of what was required for us to make that commitment. And part of that for us is that we don't necessarily own the building space in which we occupy in all of our own offices. So that multi, you know, multi-year data collection took quite some time to get things like our own utility usage from our leased space across our, our global um, portfolio of office spaces. So that's part of that first start. We had to start with that data collection. And I think that's the first piece in terms of having each one of the organizations that are attending today start to understand their scope one, two, and three emissions, where they come from, and how they can then start to mitigate those emissions themselves. So that's that first step that we took. And it's how we started that path towards net zero in 2050. Great. Thanks for that. And if anybody's, if anybody's curious about scope one, two, and three, we had a, we had a whole session on that back in the spring around uh, how you define all those pieces. So Perfect. We can so sure I, we I can give you the, the quick scorecard. Scope one is everything in your control. Uh, anything you directly control. Scope two is things you have indirect control on. And scope three is that larger sphere that you are able to advocate for reduction on. Perfect. Hey, there you go. That was the 10 second read. There you forget, forget my hour webinar then. There you go. <laughs> I just did it in 10 seconds. Um, so I want to think of, because yes, and, and, and cognizant that we, 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 we have people on the line here who have hundreds of employees. We have people on the line who have three. Um, but I want to pick up a, a, a point that you, that you mentioned there, Tanya, and, and, and maybe some people, we can all comment on how important that kind of the, in the internal working. So you have 19,000 employees, but, and you, but you still have a working group internally that does that, and they have access to, and I'm assuming support from top leadership. And that's a model that can work whether you have 19,000 employees or 19 employees is finding those champions internally and then making sure that they're, they have the power to, to move things forward or, or to get access to the board in your case, or to the CEO in a smaller company. Can, can you speak to how, and, and Allison, I'll bring you in here as well on, on Dancy side, like how important is it having both that kind of top down, this is a priority for our organization, but also having the, the, boots on the ground to implement it or, or does, and does, or does one way work better is, is if we have people on the line here who perhaps aren't the owners of their business, but maybe they're managers and this is something that they, that they want to see the company do. 
you have any thoughts on how they can maybe move that from the ground up if they don't yet have that buy-in from the top? Yeah, so I, I think it's actually top down and bottom up at the same time. And I like to think that we always meet in the middle. In terms of our organization, it is something that our employees champion. And I maybe live in a bit of a bubble in terms of our own operations in that I'm sister surrounded on a daily basis by individuals like Brad and Sam and our team that live and breathe car carbon reduction. So, you know, we're, we're in there. But overall, we certainly know that our younger generation and some of those that are now under 30 are seeing climate change as a crisis. And we're seeing that come out of that every day. So we're talking about this really even as an inclusivity uh, or employee attraction and retention. How are people choosing their employers? Where are they choosing to have an impact? You know, our commitment to Architecture 2030 and some of those are certainly uh, a key element in terms of how we believe our employees are choosing to continue the great work that they're doing at our organization. So, and then, you know, we're fortunate we do have that corporate leadership that is finding that meeting in the middle solution as well. And understanding that this is our path forward. And it's not just our path forward as an organization, but it's our clients path forward in terms of achieving the goals and the sense of climate urgency that we have in, in uh, all of our practice. Thanks for that. Alex, I was like yes. on mute there. Did you want to jump in at all? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I would, I, would, I would really echo what Tanya says. I think it is both. It's bottom up and top down. I saw something the other day and it said a, a goal without a plan is just a wish. So, you know, you could, you could set vision at the top, but you need to then, um, you know, put resources, you know, people who can deliver um, and empower them in, in order to be able to do that. Um, and so I think it comes about in organizations in different ways. Sometimes it's something that employees really want to see and they advocate for, and, and that sort of gets it up to, to um, the senior leadership or it's the other way around. And I think that the best result is when, it, when it's coming from, from both directions. And then it's just figuring out, okay, what are we going to work on together? And, and then how are we going to go about delivering on that? How are we going to go about figuring out our plan in terms of, um, of what we're going to what we're going to deliver. And I think it's important that, that there is that engagement to ensure that that plan is holistic and it, and it covers, as I talked about before, the sort of the negative and positive. So you'll, you'll need that feedback from, from your place. Like what are, what are our most like our significant positive impacts? What are our significant negative impacts? Um, and then how do we work to, to maximize the one and, and, and minimize the other? And, and it's a whole group in order to, to do that. And if you, if you aren't thinking about that holistically across um, your organization, what you can get is then, you know, one negating the other. Um, you could do a lot of positive things, but if you are, are not leaning into maybe your, some of your more significant areas of impact, it, it can be a little bit for not sometimes. Great. Thanks for that. Sorry, my, someone's trying to get a hold of me there. Um, Allison, I had a question here that was for um, for you, and and I'll preface it because we kind of saw at, at COP we saw um, uh, Bank, Can Bank of Canada Governor Mark Carney come out with the Glasgow Financial Alliance talking about leveraging private investment to drive sustainability, and you spoke about how you wanted to kind of drive to net zero on kind of not just your your what you do at Van City, but the things that you're you're financing and, and having responsibility for that. Um, there's a question around kind of what does that lead for kind of the conversations then that you would have with people who are either seeking investments from you, maybe people you have who have you've had long-standing relationships to, but maybe wouldn't fit that model. And, and do you have any thoughts on how um, either businesses or maybe your vendors can can make sure that they're on the right side and and, and standing with you on this um, if if you're moving in this direction? Like how how does a company handle having those conversations? Not just tackling their own thing is one thing, but then if they're trying to tackle upstream from vendors or suppliers, or in your case, I guess, downstream, the things that you're, you're funding, how do you have those conversations with, with people who um, might understand why you're getting involved in that? Yeah, and um, I thanks for that mention. So we are part of that group under, under Mark Carney and GFANS, we're a signatory to the Net Zero Banking Alliance, which is, which is part of that Global Glasgow um, finance initiative um, umbrella. So we're part of that, that calculation of private finance um, that's moving towards towards net zero. Um, and it's been a great group to be part of. I mean, it's, it, this is tough work, um, especially for financial institutions and others to, to figure out, to work through how we do that. 
um, on those scope three emissions, right? Because as, as Tanya said, it's, it's that you, they're not in your direct control and there's a lot of work there that you need to do in terms of advocacy. I would say that as we're starting from a different point than maybe some other financial institutions in terms of we typically, um, because of the nature of our business, are not banking um, and, and offering financing to typically heavy emitting sectors. So um, significant transport like aviation um, or even the, the fossil fuel sector. Our emissions are actually primarily from buildings. Um, when it comes to our scope three emissions, our book is uh, quite heavy on mortgages, so residential and commercial mortgages. And so we are very, um, we'll be working a lot in terms of how do we support decarbonization of the buildings within our portfolio. So I was very interested to listen to, um, to Stantec's presentation today. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of our work will be around engaging our members on that, on exactly that messaging. I loved it around codes are, or the language, you know, how do we support our members in terms of, um, you know, kind of being ahead um, of not getting even caught behind, you know, some of the changes and, and regulations that are happening. Um, and how do we help them understand some of the other benefits associated with these changes? So buildings being healthier, more comfortable, um, uh, and potentially, you know, of, of higher value, um, just given some of the changes that will happen. So there's quite a bit of work for us in terms of supporting um, efforts there. And we're also trying to figure out which stakeholders we work with in the community in order to drive that. So a lot of our conversations with our members will be around um, buildings um, and how to, to make transitions there. Um, and then for our business members more broadly on their operations. So that's why you're seeing us produce things like that guide in order to support businesses in that direction. Um, we see it very much as a conversation, um, not a sort of, oh, uh, you know, you've got these emissions, sorry. Um, we're not gonna be uh, involved with you. It, at the moment, that just means an organization can go seek financing somewhere else. And that's not the, the result that we want. We really wanna be able to um, engage and support businesses um, in terms of the transition that they need to make. And that'll ultimately, we can position them um, better in, in the low carbon economy um, that, we, that we are entering towards. And I would say in some ways, it's the same with suppliers. Um, we wanna work with our suppliers to understand how um, they are making a transition towards net zero and how we can support that. Um, and I think the biggest thing a supplier can do is, is to have done some of that work to understand their negative and positive impacts, their emissions, um, and have a plan to work towards reductions. Um, and certainly we would want to work with our suppliers in order to support that. So if we have resources or information that, that can work, help them in their business, we'd want to share that. And certainly we would benefit from some of those emissions reductions as well. Thanks for that, Alison. And we've had a, we've had a few sessions on, on companies kind of who are, are whether it's social procurement or or leveraging what they what, what they're doing with their supply chains and then that's a common thread is, is you don't just slam the door in someone's face because then they're just going to go and move on to somewhere else where it's, if you can if you can move with your suppliers and and help move them along well then you're actually increasing your impact because you're not just improving your own uh, uh, operations you'll if you help them improve theirs well then everyone that they supply to is, is better off as well. So I, 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 I took note of that kind of, that you're, you're working with your, your, your clients and your suppliers to, in, in this space to kind of move everyone in the same direction. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, one of the, the terms that kind of bounced around and I don't know how much I love it because I'm going to kind of first heard and went, what do you mean there? But it was talking about ensuring that as you set targets towards net zero to your interim targets, which we're working through right now, is that you're making sure that you're having impact in the real economy. And what's meant by that is that you're not simply just moving things off your books, right? Or not, not engaging. And that's actually a big focus um, and discussion uh, in the financial sector right now. It's like, how do you ensure real economy impact? Um, so it's, it's exactly that, it's that engagement piece. You're keeping them on your books but then supporting the reductions that that, that that business needs to do or that supplier needs to do versus simply, you know, ending a relationship. And there might be some places for that if, a, if an organization just has no plan and, and doesn't want to engage and like isn't bought in, then maybe that's a point that you need to get to. Um, but certainly the, the main focus over, over a longer period of time is like, how do we engage with you and support that and go on that journey together? Great, thanks for that. Um, 
Samantha and Brad, I'll bring you in on, on this one. I think, um, I think Samantha, you mentioned kind of the embodied carbon and kind of understanding kind of what's involved in, in things that are already built. So we have a question here from Clark around, um, when we look at, at the carbon emissions that kind of go into things, even things that might be sustainable, so green buildings, or he's mentioned SkyTrain systems and mass transit systems, um, how do we know that these kind of the, pre, the pre-opening emissions, are they actually being, are they accounted for to ensure that, that we're looking at something from cradle to grave, or do we, or is it kind of, Carbon accounting counts. Carbon accounting only kind of starts on opening days. This question. So, do you have any thoughts on how we account for all the stuff that goes into getting us to a part where we can say, okay, now we're net zero, but do we? How do we account for the stuff before that bit? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I'd say when it comes to approaching net zero carbon, um, at least the buildings industry, but I think the same is sort of similar in other areas. It, we're starting with operational carbon. So what can we do to make sure that when we operate this building, we're getting to zero? But everyone's very aware that we need to be looking at the cradle to grave side of things. We need to be looking at the life cycle and we need to think about how we're building those buildings and how we're going to make up for that. True net zero can't be net zero if you're putting in a whole bunch of carbon into, you know, manufacturing steel, curing concrete, all those things. So the struggle that we're having with embodied carbon right now is compared to what? Um, any, any, we don't have a good baseline. Um, and that's something that a bunch of different groups are working on developing right now. So you can't, if you're building something, you're, you're sort of intrinsically, you are investing carbon into it right now. That's how it works. So we're really focusing as a practice on making sure we're making good informed decisions about selecting the materials that have lesser impacts. Um, And I totally expect to see that within the next few years, we'll have much better standards kind of dictating what makes a good level of embodied carbon and what is too much embodied carbon. So I hope that helps. It looks like Brad might have Brad's town is fourth again. power yeah. outage right now. So every time he loses power, he loses internet. So our, our apologies. This is, uh, I think, what our colleagues in BC are dealing with on an hour by hour basis right now, of course. So I'll, I'll add to that that piece about the new innovations and what we're seeing come forward in terms of carbon technologies. And I'll, I'll just add a lens from Alberta in that I chair uh, an organization called the Smart Sustainable Resilient Infrastructure Association as well. Um, and it's it's really looking at innovations for the built environment, but that embodied carbon piece is coming up on a regular basis because we are primarily focused on innovation for operational carbon, but embodied carbon is that next layer. And and like what Sam Sam has suggested, it's it's how we start to account for that carbon in in that way to demonstrate improvement. And you know that innovation is there; it's in the market already. Uh, we have a number of technologies that are ready to address it. Uh, we're just waiting for them to get to a technology readiness level that they're marketable and that they're scalable. And we'll start to see, I think, more of this as well. And just in my experience, start to come forward really in the coming years, like Sam said. So I uh, I can just uh, wholeheartedly agree with what Sam just said. Awesome. Thanks for that. I know we're, we're, we're galloping towards the, our, our end time here. So um, I thought uh, I would take a moment just to thank uh, all. And then I'll, I'll start with Brad first before we lose him again. Brad, thanks so much for, for being here. And, and Samantha, Alice, and Tanya, we really appreciate you sharing what you've been doing in your organizations, your thoughts on, on, on these topics and helping kind of um, uh, our members and those who are watching here um, get a bit more involved in this space and, 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 and educate themselves on, on where they can go in their own organization. So really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Thank you.